The following program is a specialty program. Unless otherwise identified, the participants on the program are not employees of Chorus Entertainment. Opinions expressed may not necessarily reflect the views and policies of Global News Radio 640 Toronto. It is indeed. Welcome to it. 11.05 on a Saturday morning, a cool one, but uh, going to be a good weekend regardless. If you're out and about doing stuff, do it by yourself and be careful. In and out, back and forth. There you go. That's all you're allowed to do. But uh, we'll get to that a little later on. You want to call through now. you got tons of time. We're just starting the show, Pinpoint Health Show. Dr. Lou is all set to answer your questions. You know that number, 416-870-6400. You have some health concerns for yourself or calling on behalf of someone else. That is fine. Lines are open for uh, just under the next hour, 416-870-6400. Info at pinpointhealth.ca and simply pinpointhealth.ca. The website will give you leads and locations of various clinics that are around and open and serving you and helping you through these issues as well. So feel free to reach out anytime. Good morning, pal. How are you? Good morning, John. I'm well. How are you? Doing okay. Ready to uh, ready to rock. What do you got on the docket today, pal? Awesome. A couple things. So I want to address a couple concerns. I did have uh, uh, someone, a listener of the show, connected um, with my office last week and was sort mm-hmm. of uh, giving some advice in terms of, uh, um, I guess, some of the conversation that we've had over the last few months where we will uh, – um, um, you know, go into the vaccine topic or the COVID topic. And, and they really felt that, you know, the focus of the show um, should be what I'm an expert in as a chiropractor, which is pain management. Um, you know, and, and obviously that is what we try to focus. I think I, I do my best every time to let people know where my scope of practice is. Um, obviously, you know, it's a topic nowadays so it it would be almost impossible for it to come up i think you know one of the other concerns was that she was saying you know people will call in or ask about heart problems and and obviously that's not my specialty um it's just tough to say every single minute of the show uh you know hey my specialty is this so obviously it's a health related show it's pinpoint health although my specialty is one thing we actually have a large team of people that we can help with a lot of different things um you know and again so my specialty is not as important i think as a general topic for the show um and obviously i think i've made it clear you could be you could tell me if i'm wrong john you're here every week with me um whenever it's something that's out of my scope and i you know can't comment on um you know i i I sort of make that very clear in fact there's times when about things that I know nothing about and I I will just simply say I have no idea um and and try to give people the most honest answer so I do appreciate the feedback because I obviously the people who listen I'd like to know sort of if there's things that we could do better so um you know I'll try my best to keep on on to certain topics that are I guess more relevant for what people want to listen to being pain management uh, but obviously things come up and I, and I want people to feel like this is a place that they can call in and sort of discuss their overall health. It doesn't mean that obviously nothing that we're doing on this show is not, we're not diagnosing or managing. We're just using this as a springboard to have a conversation and provide knowledge and education. Um, so I think, you know, some calls that may not necessarily be related, um, you know, I don't discourage them because it's always good to talk about things. Uh, and I am allowed to have an opinion. Um, that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that it's my scope, but I can have an opinion. Um, so yeah, so that, that's sort of my two cents on that There's sort of concern was, um, and I won't go into great detail about this one, but what I will say is this, when people, my job is, is very clear. I'm going to see people within my scope of practice, which is primarily musculoskeletal health. So if you've got problems with the bones, joints, muscles, aches and pain, et cetera. So number one, we, we, we make sure that anybody coming to see me specifically for an assessment falls within my scope of practice. That's number one. Number two is this. It would be a disservice for me to provide people the opinions that they want reaffirmed. My job is really okay. to, to assess the person, take a thorough history, physical exam, consider everything, and sort of come up with a list of things that I think are going on based on my knowledge. Now, I'm never going to force anybody to accept my opinion. That that's not, that's not my job, right? That's no healthcare professional's job. But I'm also not going to just reaffirm what somebody else wants to hear because they have a preconceived notion of what may already be wrong with them. My job is really to assess 
and to determine, okay, here's what I think is going on. And that's very important. You don't have to buy into the what I think. I base my what I think on what's called evidence-based medicine, which is the best scientific evidence uh, based on, on literature and, and good quality literature, clinical experience, not just my own, but other clinicians' clinical experience. And then obviously, again, what the patient wants so um, or what the patient expectations are. And Again, I bring this up because of an unfortunate incident that, that happened this week. And I, again, not, not going to go into detail. But what I do want to say is this, that really the reality is I'm, I, my job, I would be doing you a disservice if you're coming in. And I'm only going to tell you or reaffirm what you believe if I don't actually believe that or, or it's not consistent with, with my evidence-based approach. I can't do that. It's not something to do because I think it's wrong. And it's not the due diligence that anyone would expect of me uh, in my role. And, and number two, it, it's 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 a malpractice thing, right? I can't just give an opinion right. that I can't actually back up because uh, someone else wants to hear that. So, you know, and again, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people have always understood this, and I and I and I actually think that most people that hear me on this show come see me for that very reason because they know that I'm going to sort of give what my opinion is that would be the reason right like I want to go see that guy because uh you know I sort of jive with what he says and it makes sense and that's consistently what I what I hear uh but again it, my job is to provide you my my opinion based on my knowledge and based on my evidence based approach I can't just you know provide it because someone else has said it or you believe it that that's not evidence based medicine and again, I'm not telling you that, like, once I finish telling you something, you don't have to accept that. You're more than welcome to go get another opinion, go see if it concurs with somebody else's, someone, that's totally fine. I, I'm not, I'm never, ever, and will never, ever force anybody into to accepting my opinion. Uh, it, but my job is my opinion and, and coming to it in an evidence-based approach. And, and that's really what I'm going to hang my hat on. Um, and that's the, the approach that I'm always going to take, which I, again, I think most people want that. They do. And the problem is they, they not, they want it, but they don't want to hear it. You know what I mean? Sometimes that's, that's the hard truth. They know what they should hear, but they don't always accept what you're going to tell them. And you're always put it out straight. I mean, you've always done that since the beginning of the show. If it's in your bailiwick, if it's part of your wheelhouse, you will give an opinion and it should be heated. But if it's not, you'll pass it off to someone else. But you, I mean, don't you do the same thing inside your clinics when people come see you as well? Oh, I've tried everything. I've done this. Nothing works. And you'll be like, have you really tried everything? Have you done this? No, I don't think you've done that. It's just clarity, and I don't think there's a, there's a lot of misinformation and lack of clarity, I think, when it comes to people's yeah. health care and dealing with it. So it's, it's kind of a breath of fresh air, if you ask me. That's what I expect from you anyway. Yeah, and I really I think that's what everyone should expect from every healthcare professional. Again, that's our due diligence as licensed professionals is to give you the best evidence-based advice, um, and then it's up to you, the patient. Remember, that third component of evidence-based care is what the patient wants. Obviously, if, if you're not accepting of the, the clinician's experience and of the scientific evidence, that's fine. You're the most important part in that combination, but that doesn't mean that the clinician needs to change their opinion in order to, to meet that. And so, you know, that's the reality. And the other thing is this, I, I really, really strive to be extremely respectful with everyone. So even sometimes when I am having hard conversations, I don't have a hard conversation in, in a way that ever is disrespectful or anything like that. It's just simply about outlining what I see there and what I'm getting from, from my exam. And and then delivering that and trying to work with the person and make them understand. And that's really what I try to spend a lot of time on is what's the understanding component. And so, you know, respect is a big thing. And, 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 and I sort of bring this up because respect's a two-way street. You're going to get it from me, but I also deserve it back. Um, and, and that's a very, very important thing, right? Like we, it's got to be a, a comfortable environment for everybody. Um, and, and I think that's, that's an important thing. So again, without getting into too much detail, I just wanted to address these things because I think they're important. Number one, in regards to the show, what we just spoke about where, yes, my, my, my scope is within the musculoskeletal health and that's where I'm going to be much better positioned to answer anything, of course. Um, and so if you've got pain and injury problems, aches and pains, give us a call and I'm happy to sort of have a conversation with you see if we can provide any type of clarity, use it as a springboard for conversation and for education and knowledge, which I think is what I 
um, am trying to do with this show. And number two, in the clinical setting, again, my job is really to provide you my opinion based on my knowledge and my evidence-based approach. And I'm never going to force that opinion on anybody. If someone doesn't like it, that's fine. And I'm actually even happy to hear if you don't like it and if you don't agree. I'm okay with that. I, it, it doesn't that doesn't matter. It's just about being respectful uh, of each other is what's very, very important. And again, 416-870-6400, 416-870-6400, the number if you have any uh, concerns this morning, something you've uh, wanted to talk to Dr. Lou about all week, bring it on. Could be uh, you know some sort of personal issue or calling on behalf of a bashful or shy friend or family, uh, family member, bring it on, 416-870-6400. 6,400. Has there been a, an overwhelming theme uh, as we get into our, we got a couple minutes before we break, but has there been like a, something that's been in overwhelmingly showing up in your clinics in the last couple of weeks? I mean, is it stuff that's COVID related or if it's all musculoskeletal or people are starting to get out it's, exercising with the weather and starting to bang up yeah. knees, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's actually, you know, funny enough, it, it's, it's musculoskeletal, yes, but musculoskeletal can mean a lot of different things. So, You know, when you bang up your knee, that's sort of a traumatic incident or like, you know, you're doing a lot of stuff. And so because you're doing a lot of that, you're getting sore and it's more overuse. What I'm actually seeing more of is the deconditioning aspect where people are doing less. Muscles are becoming weaker, which in turn affects the tendons and the ligaments. And that's what's creating aches and pains now. And it's really from disuse, right? And and I mean, the extreme example of disuse is if anybody's ever had a limb in a cast, when you take that cast off, that side is completely atrophied. It's, 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 you know, half the size of the other side, because when you completely stop using something, it's not, it's not going to have that strength and stability that it requires. Now, that's obviously an extreme example. But yeah. if you're spending more time than you ever have not moving around, and your aches and pains are going up, that's a result of disuse. That's, that's sort of like, you know, it's not you being in a full cast. But if you're not doing anything, it's sort of, you know, it's that analogy. Like if you're not using your body, it's going to decondition. And as it deconditions, it's going to lead to increased pain levels and aches and, and other issues. That's just the reality of it. And so that's something, and I think we'll carry on that conversation after the break, but that's absolutely something I've been seeing a lot of. And we'll do exactly that. Again, you got lots of time to call and ask your questions. Uh, you have some issues, uh, health issues, bring them on. Get, uh, get, get, a, get a quick answer. At least get down the right road to begin with. 416-870-6400. Info at pinpointhealth.ca to reach out by email as well. We'll continue. Pinpoint Health Show, Global News Radio. And welcome back. Pinpoint Health Show. You want to reach out to Dr. Lou anytime. The clinics all around, always growing as well, are open and serving you. So make sure you reach out for sure. That number, by the way, one 855 Dr. Lou. D-R-L-O-U. Really simple. Info at pinpointhealth.ca. But here now for your questions, bring them on. you got lots of time remaining on the show this morning. It's only, what, 1122 and 416 870 6400 is uh, how you do that. So bring it on. We got open lines and lots of time. Okay, pal, take it away. Where are we going back to? Hey, John. Uh, yeah, we're going to. I, I want to continue on that deconditioning, but you just said something there that is mm-hmm. extremely relevant right now with the new lockdown and the announcements from uh, the provincial government. So we, we are still, even as a result of yesterday's announcement, everything is still happening for us, um, thankfully, because. Again, we can't put people's health care on hold. Um, so again, you can feel like it's a safe environment. Obviously, everyone's got to take um, the level of precautions. Um, you know, the majority of our staff are actually now vaccinated as well um, as a result of being in healthcare. So that's another uh, advantage. But we don't take the, the responsibility lightly that we are essential. We still make sure that we're doing all the steps at every clinic um, to ensure everyone's safety and to make sure um, that, you know, you're getting what you need. And, you know, obviously we, we're, we're talking with people. If we feel like, you know, you don't have to come in and it's something that could be a conversation or whatever, and there's ways that, that it can be done to make it safer for everybody, we will uh, go with that option as well. So you can rest assured that we're, again, trying to minimize everything. It's only appointment-based. There are no walk-ins happening, um, uh, constant sanitization, PPE, all the all the stuff that I think now after a year we're all used to. But I, I just wanted to, again, mention that we don't take this lightly. Um, it's, it's a responsibility uh, that we have. And, and it's, it, you know, in a, in a way, it's also a privilege that we are still able 
to serve the communities where we are. So um, it's an important thing, and, and we're not gonna and we're not gonna tread lightly on that. We're gonna make sure that we do everything that we need to as an organization. Um, but going back to sort of how we finished that last segment, speaking about what is it that we're seeing a lot of in the clinics, yeah. and, and it was a great question that you asked there, John, because. Again, what I'm really seeing is, is again, of course, we see the vast majority of what we see as musculoskeletal injuries because we're primarily a musculoskeletal rehab-based uh, company. But a lot of things can affect musculoskeletal health. One of the things that absolutely can affect musculoskeletal health is deconditioning. So when your muscles are becoming weaker, and as they become weaker, that's creating you know excessive. Uh, um, or, or more instability in areas and leading to aches and pains. And obviously in the time that we live in now, we've never had people doing less, unfortunately, right? And yeah. because they're doing less, they're getting more and more and more deconditioned. I actually was at the clinic this morning seeing a patient whose complaint was that because of sitting, the muscles in their butt are hurting. And that was the complaint. And it's like, well, of course, like if you're spending the majority of your day sitting, you know, of course, those muscles are going to hurt. And of course, that deconditioning is going to set in and start to create low back pain, hip pain, and that whole pelvic, uh, lumbopelvic girdle is going to be affected. So that deconditioning is a huge thing right now. And obviously, even people that want to do more you know, because of circumstances can't do more. But I really, really want to encourage everybody that at least try to do something. I mean, I, I could tell you the reality is this within a two by two space, two feet by two feet, you can do enough that at least you keep some level of conditioning, right? I'm not saying that that's obviously as good as a gym or being able to do what you otherwise would want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not that naive. I know it's not. But can you prevent a lot of these aches and pains by having a two by two area or a two by four area? Yeah, you know, there's fundamental things like squatting, right? Just, you know, body weight squats up and down, mm -hmm. moving around, push ups, uh, planking, modified sit ups, jumping jacks, all kinds of stuff that, that really you can do if you need to do. Um, and I think it's important that everybody does that. And, you know, outside of just strengthening, one of the things that I really want people to understand when it comes to ache and, aches and pains, and the first step of, of reconditioning a muscle isn't just making it stronger. It's also about getting your cardiovascular health back. Yep. And it's about, because if you have poor cardiovascular health, how's the blood going to get to the area? How's it going to service that muscle that's going to require more as you get healthier? So, you know, thankfully now at the very least, we're starting to get nicer weather. And we've even heard the government exercise outdoors, go for walks. Like, and again, I, I'm a realist when it comes to what moderate physical activity means, which has been shown to be beneficial for overall health and cardiovascular health. We're not talking about running a marathon. We're talking about go for a 30 minute walk three or four times a week, just contribute to your cardiovascular health. And then try to do some fundamental things, although they may seem horribly boring and whatever. And, and, and really, if anyone sort of, there's tons of resources on this online, but just even go to Pinpoint Health's Instagram page or Facebook page or whatever it is, we're constantly posting different exercises and things that can be done in a very, very small area with little to no equipment. And that's another big thing. You don't need all that fancy stuff in order to, again, keep Fitness at its most basic level. I'm again. I, I'm not being naive. I know obviously, you know, people want to be doing more, and and people are used to doing more. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm talking about for people who are starting to experience aches and pains. And if you're sitting there thinking, "Wow, I spend the majority of my day really not moving at all," you got to get moving. I, I I did a presentation this week for a group of Humber College students on posture advice um, because there's there's been sort of an increase incidents of aches and pains as a result of posture and you know potentially the greatest lie uh, in the posture world is that there is such thing as a good static posture because i don't care how perfectly aligned you are or what ergonomic device you're doing if you're not moving around every 10 minutes if you're not changing what your body's doing we are not meant to be static creatures we are dynamic creatures and so i don't care how ideal your posture is how great your ergonomic setup is that stuff is all contributes to to helping but the most fundamental thing that anybody can do 
is get up and move every 10 minutes. And I'm not talking about if you've sat for 10 minutes, you've got to move for an equal 10 minutes. No, get up for 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it is. Take a walk around the kitchen table or or, or, or in the living area where you're watching TV. I, I don't care. Do a couple jumping jacks. Like, change it up. Like, you've got to do that. The greatest lie that we talk about in the posture world is that there's this idea of good posture for a prolonged period of time. And there isn't. It's, it's not true. Any prolonged yep. posture, I don't care how ideal it is in terms of body mechanics, is going to create pain. It's going to create injury because we are not meant to be that way. The number 416-870-6400. You have questions, answers. Start right here. In that regard, we'll get to uh, to Melissa. First call up this morning. Good morning, Melissa. How are you? Good morning. Thanks. Good. How are you? Excellent. What's uh, What's on your mind? Well, I I hurt my back uh, back in November, and I've been on this kind of like journey through trying to get better, trying to get answers for my next step. And, you know, with everything going on with the pandemic, there's just been kind of like an excuse after excuse. And myself, I've been trying to, like you said, like keep active, keep moving. I do work in an office, but it's not yeah. where I'm sitting at my desk Consistently all day. I have. I get up. I have to do paperwork. I, I have two different positions. I got to walk to the other side of the um, warehouse very frequently. But it's. I can't sit at my desk. I can't. Like there's a lot. So of have you have you had mind. this investigated at all, Melissa? Yes, I did go to my doctor. I had an MRI, and it's a lot of nerve pain. And they're saying I'll go to physio and you know, do your stretches, do your exercises. And we can't find an answer for me to be able to just even sit there, stand there, walk there without being in pain. And, and have you done have you done the therapy? Yes, I, I go to physio twice a week. Um, I, okay. I have a couple different medications, but they're not working, and it's like I I don't know how to proceed. Yeah, yeah. So it's so yeah, and I appreciate the call, and I can also appreciate what you're going through. So obviously, I I can't exactly determine what the best plan and management is over the phone because I haven't seen you. But what I can say is this. Number one, some not all back injuries are equal in, in the sense of, you know, some people might hurt their back and they feel better a week later. And some people hurt their back and it can take a prolonged period of time, even with the right interventions to get better. So that's the number one thing to realize because back not all back pain is equal and not all back pain is the same diagnosis. It's just a symptom, back pain. The question becomes, what is the underlying structure that's creating the problem? The next thing that's really important in any type of injury is if there's something that contributes to that injury, like a repetitive thing, like prolonged sitting. It's sort of, I always give the analogy, if you had a cut, and if every time that cut started to heal, you ripped off the scab, that cut would never heal. And, and that is a lot of the times the issue too with these types of injuries where, you know, a good example, just a simple thing, let's take like golfer's elbow, right? Where you've got this pain and, and let's assume that it's from golfing. I see a lot of people who have that and say, you know, it still hurts. I'm getting treatment. I'm getting the things I'm doing, but it still hurts. My next question is, well, are you still golfing as much? And the answer is, well, yeah. And and it's like, well, if, you know, if you, if you continue the repetitive problem, then it makes it very hard to treat. Now, I'm also, I'm also, again, a realist in the sense that I'm not trying to tell you not to work, by the way, like, or, or not to sit or, or whatever. But it's, that is the plan that the therapist needs to work on, too. What are the ways that the daily activities that might be creating that repetitive nature or that ongoing strain sprain uh, um, presentation, what modifications can be made to help, um, at the very least, offset that? The other thing that's fundamentally important and often gets missed in these types of injuries, and I don't know because I haven't asked you the question, but and I'm not saying it's the case, but one of the biggest things that as you move through this, so you're talking about November, we're in April, that's a long enough period of time where the majority of what you're doing right now from a therapy standpoint should be exercises that you're doing alone, that you're doing every single day. And I don't know if that's the case, and if it's not, then that's an issue. Right. No, absolutely. Like I have been given uh, like assignments basically for what to do every like 30 minutes, every hour, different stretches that I get up out of my seat and do whether it. What about like, strengthening? So stretches are one thing. And but what about strengthening core rehabilitation, like actually working, you know, at least once a day on that? Yeah, so absolutely. Like part of those those stretches are 
uh, exercises where I like doing breathing through like using my core when I like sit to stands this uh, just to kind of activate different muscles and be more body conscious. And, and have those exercises been progressed? So that, like, as an example, what you just said there is sort of introductory. Like, are you getting to the point where you're planking, doing bird dogs, any of these other um, no. types of exercises? So, no. Yeah, and so there you go. That, that's a fundamental step. Rehabilitation is not like this one static thing where it's like, here's an exercise, go do it and you'll get better. It's the, 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 the misnomer there is really we should add the term progressive rehabilitation. So as somebody, it would be no different than like I give people the analogy if you wanted to lose weight and I said, okay, I want you to start with 30 minutes of walking every day. If you just do that forever, what you'll say is, well, I lost a little bit of weight, but now I'm not really losing any more weight. Bodies adapt. So then I, what I would need to say is, okay, now I want you to jog lightly for 30 minutes a day or whatever variation, but it's got to be progressive and rehabilitation is the same and exercises are the same. You've, they've got to become more and more and more challenging because your body's going to adapt and that's what's going to prevent the plateauing of, of continued progression. Melissa, appreciate the call. You want to reach out further to Dr. Lou and his team, have a chat would be a good idea. one 855 Five five, Doctor Lou D R L O U. Appreciate that, and uh, do so. We got uh, Tony on the line. Tony, stand by. We're going to get to you after a short break, and you as well. Lots of time. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred. Pinpoint Health Show, Global News Radio. Hey, welcome back. Eleven thirty eight. Pinpoint Health Show. That's the number. Use it. Lots of open lines. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred to talk to Doctor Lou. Tony, thank you so much for standing by. Good morning. How are you? Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. How are you, you today? Good, sir. What's uh, what's good. on your mind? Yeah, uh, actually, I just wanted to find from the doctor. Um, I was uh, recently uh, diagnosed with a manicose uh, tear on my knee. And yep. uh, I wanted to find out, uh, is there any uh, easy way to go? Like, I mean, I'm not even sure how I even got to that point. Uh, once I did my MRI and uh, they saw me, I have a tear on it. So my question is, uh, is there a way we can get this uh, uh, by doing the physios or something, or do I have to go to the surgical procedure for this? Yeah, so it's a good question. So there, num- number one, I don't know because I'd have to look at what type of meniscal tear is, if it, you know whether we're talking something that's degenerative or whether it's something that is – Uh, traumatic, how bad it is, the symptoms that you're going through. So what I can answer you with this is this. Some meniscal tears and problems heal with conservative treatment like therapy, things like that. And then some end up requiring surgery. I would always say, and and I would assume whoever did the MRI for you would have probably given a recommendation. I'm not sure what that recommendation is. There's some instances where maybe surgery is the best first option. But I I don't think they're the majority of cases. It really depends on a lot of things. But, you know, I'm always of the opinion of always trying more conservative measures before ever jumping to something that's more invasive. Now, again, that's sort of I I put an asterisk next to that because it depends on what type of tear and the the symptoms and everything that are going on specifically with you. Great. So uh, I was actually at the doctor and uh, they said that they're going to refer me to um, the ortho to give them uh, yeah. to get them a uh, professional consultation from there. But uh, I do feel like when I, you know, the problem I'm getting is when I come down the stairs, I feel like uncomfortable feeling. It's not hurting, but it's uncomfortable feeling that I have to go through. Yeah. So, yeah, one of the big problems with this is that Number one, the, the amount of time it might take to see a surgeon, it could be prolonged. That doesn't help anything. And a lot of the times when you're dealing with these low-level meniscal issues, the surgeon will say, try therapy first. So you'll, you might end up waiting a very long period of time to just hear what you could be doing now. And that, that is something that in healthcare management is often done wrong at the primary care level, where um, really that should also be the recommendation. It should be yeah, we're going to send you to get the opinion of the surgeon for sure. But at the same time, you should probably get started on some type of rehab. And the reality is this, even if you did need surgery, that rehab is not a waste because the idea of strengthening and trying to get better helps you to with better outcomes following surgery anyway. So uh, my sort of opinion on that is, is don't wait for that. So you think I should just like physiotherapy maybe might help or... 
potentially it might help. I'm not. I, I, what I'm saying is, is you sh- a physiotherapist, a chiropractor, somebody will be able to assess that and determine whether what they provide could per- help. If you wait too long and, and you haven't done anything in the meantime, you're just sort of going backwards instead of going forward. It really depends on, and, and a lot of the times the surgeons, like the, the knee surgeons I work with, you know, most of the time they're recommending people do therapy first before they try jumping to, to therapy, uh, to surgery. Thank you. No Thanks, problem. Tony. Appreciate uh, appreciate your time this morning. The number four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred. We got a break, but I'm going to try to get a, a bit of a, a Ian in here. Ian, we'll uh, ask your question. If we got time to answer it, we will. If not, we'll get you to hang on through the break. But uh, what's going on, pal? Good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor Lou. Um, I'll make it quick. Good morning. I've, I've, been wor- I've been working out mostly through COVID, and uh, I sort of feel like I'm plateauing a bit now. And I'm just wondering, is, would it be better to increase my weight or increase my reps? To get off Good the question, plateau. John. Do, yep, yeah, John. Do we have t- do I have time to answer that? You know what? Ian, now that we know the question, I mean, we're going to get into a deeper answer. We're going to get hit you a hold on the line. We're just going to take a short break. Ian, don't go anywhere. Now that we know what the topic right. is, and we'll get to it All after right. short break. So stand by, brother, and you as well. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred Pinpoint Health Show Global News Radio. Still got some time for your phone calls with your questions. It's real simple, 416-870-6400 to call into the show now. If you want to send uh, Dr. Lou an email when we're all done, info at pinpointhealth.ca and simply pinpointhealth.ca for lots more contact as well. Okay, we get back to uh, get back to Ian here. And, uh, Ian, welcome to it. And, uh, yeah, working out. What do you think, Dr. Lou? You go heavier reps, lighter reps. He's kind of plateauing, right? Yeah, so I guess, number one, it also depends on goals, right? So, you know, in general, if you get heavier weight, then, you know, sometimes as a result of that heavier weight, um, you're going to be able to do less less reps. And that, that is working more of an anaerobic uh, system and power, right? So a lot of, you know, like when you think of people who are um, – uh, power lifters, they're very, they're doing very little reps, uh, with extreme weight. And then, you know, somewhere in t- for hypertrophy, which means for muscle growth, people typically will do, you know, somewhere between eight to 12, um, in terms of trying to achieve muscle growth and hypertrophy. And then in terms of trying to really get definition and endurance and cardiovascular effects, then the repetitions, uh, might be something. So, so I guess my, my answer is it really depends on what your, overall goals are with what you're trying to do with being active um you know if it's a matter of just staying healthy and there's no one specific goal you could probably do a combination of both right you might you might increase your weight a little bit less what do you think about that ian yeah sorry i lost you guys yeah that that sounds great dr i was just sort of um like I was doing, I got 40 pound weights for my curls and I was just wondering, like, should I go get heavier weights or should I just, you know, I'm doing 10 reps, five sets of 10 reps. And then I just wonder if I should just start, you know, more beneficial just to increase my number of reps instead of going out and dropping dough on uh, more dumbbells, basically. It was where I was getting with it. So, Have you changed, uh, have you changed up the exercises you're doing with the dumbbells or are you just doing straight alternate yeah. curls? No, I do, I do, yeah, I do curls, I do bench row, I got a chin-up bar, so I, I, my, you know, my biceps are getting uh, lots of work that way, and then I, my bench press, I'm more flexible, like I have a lot of extra weight, so I could increase my weight, or I could, I could do either, so I was just w- wondering if there was one course better than the other, just more specific, specifically yeah. for doing curls with heavy weights. How old a guy are you, yeah. Ian? Uh, <laughs> I'm 46. Yeah, so you're 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 a little younger than me, but I found my training, and I'm sure Dr. Lou will say the same thing at his age. It kind of changes over the years. I used to be that four to six rep range, you know, a lot of deadlifting, heavier build strength, build size. But over fifty now, man, it's a combination of aerobic and uh, you know metcon and all kinds of different things to keep healthy. So that's going to change as your body gets older too, right? You get better results, yeah. Dr. Lou. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, did, I, I lost connection there, but you guys heard sort of everything I said, or was I was I just speaking to a dead phone here? No, I heard you. Well, so okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I would say that's sort of the approach, right? Like doing you know changing it up. Sometimes it's also like, and John can attest to this. You know, you could try different things and see what works better for you and what what gets you the results. But the biggest thing is this: in order to prevent plateauing, you've got to change it up. So it doesn't. It almost. Not that it doesn't matter, but if you want to stop the plateau effect, if that if that's the biggest 
concerned, then change it up. And however you change it, it is more a matter of semantics and, and, the, and the specifics. Okay. Hey, Dr. Luke, can I ask you one more quick question? Um, mm -hmm. is it, yeah, of course. Is, is it true that – so I, I uh, drink protein after I work out. Is it true that your body only absorbs 20 grams of protein at a time? Like someone, uh, um, I think my, I forgot, a doctor told me that at one point, but I think it was my chiropractor maybe, so. Yeah, so, it, so it, protein, yeah, protein consumption really mat really depends on protein need, right? So it's not, you can't say that that's the rule for everybody. I mean, you know, if you've got someone who's an extreme bodybuilder, they're going to absorb a lot of protein. Someone who doesn't need as much. You know, probably what that person, the chiropractor, was trying to trying to get across is that you've got to determine how much protein you need that's right for you. And there's formulas for that because anything above and, and beyond that, you're probably just going to excrete it through urine or it's just right. not going to be used, right? Yeah. So so it's about finding what the ideal amount is for you. Yeah, because like the protein I buy, like one scoop has like, I forget, 35 grams in there. And I just, I usually just take half or a little bit over half to get around yep. that 20 gram mark because I just figure. Listen, mo most period, people in you know, North America, yeah, most people get enough protein in their diet anyways for something a little bit more. I mean, I like to use protein shakes sometimes too, more so for a meal like supplement or, or a meal replacement. Like sometimes it's just a pain in the butt to think of what to have for breakfast so it's easier to make a shake so you know there, there's right. other advantages to it right okay yeah i just didn't know if i was wasting it having too much so i just, just wonder better to regulate it a bit right yeah no i get you thanks ian appreciate the call and it's you know that's his his general questions there how many times have we heard that over the decades with with you know not just guys but uh, women working out as well they're trying to strike that correct balance of nutrition and workout and trying to match the workout with their age and their activity level. I mean, so much of this stuff is experimentation. And, uh, you know, I think, I think to your point, the right combination is getting the right exercises that suit your body type, what you're trying to yeah. achieve. But man, you got to pay so, so much attention to your nutrition as well. Right. Yeah. And, and that the, 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 the comment you made, John, about body type, that's important. Some people have more, fast twitch types of fibers for muscle fibers and some have different ones and that might matter towards whether you'll respond better to power and hypertrophy versus endurance stuff so you know there's some people that you meet they do very little and their and their muscles grow so quickly and and that's probably because from a genetic perspective they also have the right uh, fiber type to respond to that and then there's other people who can do everything and they, they sort of find um a level of plateau that can't be broken. So that that's a great point. And that's why experimentation with different things is, um, is so important. And even when I was able to get back on and I could hear what you were saying, it, it is also about goals in life change, right? Like, yeah. you know, I can remember being young and it was all about like, you know, trying for the, the hypertrophy. <laughs> you wanted to be as big as possible. And then as you get older, it's more about like, I just want to be able to keep fitness and, and flexibility and, and other things matter more. So, um, and that's not necessarily always the case. It doesn't follow that specific timeline as I've outlined it, but that was for me what it was. Um, and so that you've got to try to meet your goals. You know, and I, I think for a lot of people too is, you know, because the situation we're in, which is only getting worse before it gets better, what you said off the top of the show about just, you know, having a four foot by four foot space in your living room or your basement or your kitchen, you know, you cannot downplay, as you mentioned, just doing body weight exercises or what they call Metcon or H H I I T, the high intensive interval training. I mean, these things take time, they take steps. And if you were to simply for the layman, just to go into YouTube and Type in body weight exercises. There is a plethora of good stuff oh, you're going to yeah. find there. And, and don't kid yourself, man. Some of this stuff is really high level, and it's really difficult yeah. to do, but you work up to it. And it's great stuff. It really is good stuff, right? T tons of stuff. And there's apps now with all this stuff. Like, again, but, you know, sometimes, I, John, I'm sort of, you know me. I'm like this person where it's like, it's really not rocket science, right? Like, all of us yeah. know, like, Push-ups are good, some modified sit-ups, a plank, some jumping jacks, some standing exactly. squats, some lunges. Like, I'm just rhyming them off, right? Like, these are, you know, bare bones types of things that you can do that can help contribute to overall fitness. And then, yeah, of course, that can get you started. But as you've suggested, you know, as you start plateauing as a result of those things, you can find other resources online to help you go even, even further. And again... Going back to, to what I said earlier, and, and I'm sure you would attest to this, I'm not talking about replacing 
you know, locations and facilities and things like that. Absolutely not. I'm just talking about what I'm seeing is there's a lot more people suffering with aches and pains. And I think of a lot of it has to do with just simple deconditioning from less use of their bodies. And, you know, the, 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 the highlight here is our bodies are meant to get used. They're meant to move. They're meant to do stuff. Um, and unfortunately, we have the circumstances that we're in. But, you know, try to do what you can within the circumstances. And that was my point. Within a two-by-two two space or a two-by-four or four-by-four four space, you can actually do a pretty good amount that at the very least can help that s- severe level of deconditioning. Yeah, it's interesting. The whole time we've been doing this show, I'm standing in my office and I've been doing high knees. And I mean, it must look absolutely silly with a set of headphones on, but I haven't stopped moving since we did this show <laughs> because it's key to keep the yeah. blood moving and keep your, because I want to go out after this and ride my bike for an hour. So I don't want to do that cold. So I think there's a lot of resources yeah. out there and Huge. you guys have a training Huge facility thing. as well and you're helping as well, right? Yeah. And, and what you just said there, John, is, 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 is so important when it comes to like injury prevention is, yeah, a lot of people right now may be getting ready to go out and run and bike. And as the weather is getting nicer, what you're doing is the right thing. You got to be getting your body warm. There's different enzymes for our muscles that work best at, at certain temperatures. And that really is important towards injury prevention is getting those areas as warm as possible. Um, that way, when you're going into it, you you can do what you have to and not worry about injury. Because again, injury is the thing that will stop you, right? I'm I'm dealing with a low back injury right now, and I've been pretty good, like training hard, cardiovascular stuff, and it's and, and it stopped me this last week because of how bad it was. And and I'm sort of this hypocrite that comes on the radio and tells people if you feel things, intervene. And and I sort of, in all honesty, let it go for a little too long uh, without intervening and thought I could push through. Um, which is the exact reason why you should never be your own doctor. Um, and, and, and it sort of has put me uh, on the sidelines right now, and, and I'm paying the price. So that, that is why it's so important to, to not do that. And, and, you know, unfortunately, yeah, maybe I was a bit hypocritical, and, and I knew, but I, I just sort of wanted to push through, and, and that's the wrong thing. And, you know, deep down I knew it was the wrong thing and not so deep either. I, I sort of knew and, and still did the wrong thing. So shame on me, I guess. And that'll do it for another week. And uh, remember, when you go to uh, Endeavor to do all these things, get your kids involved, too, because they can help you. They can do along with you. You get them off their butts. It's always a good thing to do. Reaching out uh, to Dr. Lou now that we're done, one 55 doctor Lou D-R-L-O-U. It is just that simple. Info at pinpointhealth.ca, the email address. And simply pinpointhealth.ca to book an appointment, do your own research, and get a hold of Dr. Lou's team at a clinic near you. We'll catch you next time on the Pinpoint Health Show. This is Global News Radio. The preceding program is a specialty program. Unless otherwise identified, the participants on the program are not employees of Chorus Entertainment. Opinions expressed may not necessarily reflect the views and policies of Global News Radio 640 Toronto.